Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where we're doing a slightly belated roundup of January's releases for Databricks. So, anything that went into the Databricks platform, including a brand new Databricks runtime, that's the new cluster version you can go to, with a load of features and functionality and library upgrades and all of that kind of stuff. So, we're going to do those two things together today, have a look at January 2022 to see what happened on the platform, and have a look at 10.3, the brand new Databricks runtime, which has just gone GA. So you can actually now go and have a look at that and use it in production and all that good stuff. If you're new around here, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let us know down in the comments what you think of the release, anything you are looking for, what it means to you, any changes that you cannot wait to try out. Go and have a look, see what we've got. Okay, as per usual, I've got the general blog page. This is the Azure one. There is an AWS and GCP one as well. I'm going to dive into the January changes to say what went on. Now, I normally do this in like reverse order and scroll up this list because uh, I normally do it at the end of the month and there might be some stuff that's just come out that's isn't there yet. But in this case, it doesn't really matter. It's all it's all released now, but it'll all be fine. Okay. Number one, uh, new meta stores available in different regions. Uh, essentially, whenever you're using Databricks and you use uh, the Hive meta store, whenever you say save table as, whenever you never use save table as, whenever you create a Hive table, an external Hive table over a location and you're like, then it goes and saves it into a managed Hive Metastore for you. And there's a load of different addresses where that can be. And you can go into the web channel and you can find out where your particular Hive Metastore is. If you're doing some fairly gnarly, um, you'd find network routing, you need to include a load of spaces to, to make sure you can actually go and talk to your Metastore. And now there's a load of new Metastore locations. So if you're doing a load of custom routing, you need to keep an eye on these ones, especially if you're in North or West Europe is going to affect a lot of my clients, so I do need to keep an eye on that. Okay, so that's number one. If you're doing some networking, there's new meta stores available. Two, there's a new button. Uh, it's not really a new button. They've renamed a button. So if you're in Databricks, I've got like a random notebook here. There used to be a little permissions button, kind of one of these ones that we can click on and manage who can play around with that notebook. Now they've made it a big blue share button, which is just the same thing of these people, these this group can read, run, edit, or manage a particular notebook. So can they just hit go and they can't do anything else? Can they just go and read it and then they can't even run it? Can they go and play around with it, make changes, do all that stuff? Or can they manage it? Can they clone it? Can they delete it? Do they have, can they change permissions and all that kind of stuff? So yeah, it's all good, but kind of does the same thing it used to do. It's just got a new button. So if you're looking around for permissions, no, you no longer see that little padlock. You've now got a big blue share button. Okay, cool. Uh, some more uh, additional meta stores. So again, now if you're in the central, east or other east uh, US kind of uh, Azure regions, be aware there's some uh, changes to those routings. There's a new Databricks JDBC driver. So we saw last year, there's a load of stuff going on with um, Log4j uh, libraries and a few people going, oh, okay, we need to get away from certain dependencies. We didn't think it actually affected anything on the Databricks side, uh, but there is a new version of the Databricks JDBC, which moves over uh, to the 2.17.1 version of Log4j and gets rid of that dependency. So if you're looking at kind of uh, the dependencies that you have and you're trying to make sure you don't have it for various infosec reasons, uh, you can have a look at that updated JDBC driver. Runtime's ending. So again, this is kind of just keeping on that Ah, fast march of Databricks releases. Uh, so 8.3 runtime is no longer supported and 8.4 is no longer supported. So those are kind of now dropped off the end of their kind of six month-ish support life cycle. Uh, so again, you want to be making sure you're on the nines or on the tens if you can. There are some breaking changes if you're moving major versions of Databricks releases, so keep an eye on them. Okay, slightly better news than deprecations and upgrades. Um, so if you're using job clusters, job clusters versus interactive clusters are cheaper. Uh, no, no longer called interactive clusters, right? They're now called all-purpose clusters. But if we're over on compute, we've got these all-purpose clusters and we've got job clusters. Job clusters are specifically and only created when you use the jobs API, or when you create a job manually, when you're using something like Data Factory that creates a job on the fly for you. You can say, I want you to use a job cluster. And that cluster is single serving, lives the life of that one particular job and it's a lot cheaper than the all-purpose clusters. So job clusters are great if you can use them. Uh, however, they've always had the issue where if you had wanted to kick off 20 things in parallel, 
they would each spin up their own cluster and there's a lot of waste there so it, we've always wanted to say can we just have these 20 jobs but just sharing the same job cluster don't spin up and turn off and spin up and turn off independent clusters i want a job cluster for this whole pile of work and i want you to go away at the end of it and this is a step towards this so if you're doing multiple task jobs so if you're creating some of the newer fancier jobs inside databricks and you say i would like to run this then this then this you could say keep the same job cluster across all of these tasks now, I've not had too big a dig into it. I don't know. I doubt we can do this across multiple separate jobs API calls. I don't think we can do this over things like Data Factory. If we said run in a loop, kick off these 200 notebooks, use the same job cluster. I don't think that works yet. I need to have a look. But what we can definitely do is say in a Databricks job, here's a flow of work for you to do. Use the same job cluster and that's going to save a lot of money. So really good news. That's good, good stuff. Markdown in Databricks repos. So Databricks repos, um, or rather files in repos, gave us the ability to see Markdown, to see Python, to see R, and have a play around with them in that Databricks repos uh, environment. And now we can go and have a play around with Markdown. So if you had like your uh, git Markdown uh, readme file, you can open it inside uh, Databricks repos and have a play with it. I don't think I've got an example there. Let's see if I've got a quick example knocking around here. DBX repos, read me. And there we go. And it renders as an actual proper markdown. I can go and I can edit it. I can go and kind of change, I don't know, the level of headers that we're doing. We can have a play and see it. Just the same as another markdown cell in a notebook. There's no particular magic there. But previously, if we had specific .md markdown files inside a Git repo that we use for anyone using Git, then they wouldn't really be able to see anything we're doing inside a notebook. So the fact that we can just use this just to edit markdown files means we can keep our readme's up to date, means it's a bit more baked into our development process, which is great. The closer it aligns to how people actually uh, work, the better. Okay, we've got the new runtime. We're going to step over to the new runtime in a second. I'm going to get that open another window. Uh, breaking change. So there is a change going in that might break some stuff depending on how you manage your clusters. So there's a thing called an idempotency token. I'm not going to say that more than once, um, which is essentially a uniqueness token that you give when you're using the clusters API to define and create a cluster. So you can say, create this cluster. Here's all my specifications. Here's the ID I want to give to this cluster. Not the same as the cluster ID that's auto generated by Databricks. What that means is if you then fire the cluster creation script again and give it that same token it'll go oh that that cluster already exists here's your id for it rather than blindly going sure i'll create another cluster and just having multiple clusters with the same specs when you're talking about the same thing now so that's been around for a little while what they previously used to have um is when the cluster turned off you could go and find that same cluster have i created the cluster in the past and just it's now turned off in which case I can turn it back on again or should do i need to create a whole new cluster so now when that cluster terminates, it has its item potency token wiped. So if you've got any scripts that you're, you've already built in, you've already expected to use that item potency token, and now you're having it checked to go, does it already exist? If so, turn it back on again. You need to change the scripts because now they're not going to find those clusters, which I guess even if they didn't find the cluster to go and create it anyway, it doesn't really change. Yeah, but um, you need to make sure, essentially, the behavior will change. If you're expecting it to find that existing cluster and then not have a load of extra clusters turned on, that's what you'll see. So if you're doing that kind of stuff, if you have a load of DevOps pipelines that are reliant on certain clusters being existing or not existing, have a look. You might have to change your scripts. Okay. Uh, and then finally, uh, MLflow model registry webhooks in Azure Databricks. So if you wanted to trigger various model registry things based on a webhook, so if you had an Azure DevOps pipeline that was kicking something off, and it should kind of uh, go and, I don't know, trigger the promotion of a model, trigger the rebuild and then promotion of a model if the accuracy is over a certain level. If you want to actually really get into the deep depths of automating your uh, MLOps kind of workflows, then there's some more webhooks to allow you to do that, which is pretty damn cool, but we've not really looked into it in depth yet. That's it. That is our, that is our pile of changes for January. Again, some, some interesting ones. Um, but let's go and have a look at that new cluster. So the Databricks Runtime 10.3, which as a sneaky spoiler change, if we go back to the overall platform release notes, just snuck into the start of February, uh, has gone GA. 
So whilst it came out in beta during January, it's gone GA at the start of Feb. So this is now a production release. Okay, so get rich runtime 10.3. There's the photon version. There's the ML version, normal stuff. And then again, this is using Spark 3.2.1. Again, it's going to have a fairly, that fairly new version of Spark. So different things that we're going to see in here. So there's a change, a slight behavioral change to when I'm using Parquet or Avro, where it works out what the current date time is. So we're writing down a, a timestamp and saying, okay, normalize timestamps. It used to use the JVM's uh, time zone. Now it uses the session's time zone, which defaults to the JVM's time zone. It's not too different, but if you're doing anything where you're manually specifying session-based uh, info, you're connecting, you're creating several sessions on various things, connecting into your JVM, you can actually, so far, you'll see a behavioral change there. Uh, again, I use it, I think, for a lot of the, for most people, that won't really mean anything. Um, but, yeah, it's a change to be aware of. A whole new load of functions inside um, Spark SQL. And one of them is really, really interesting. So when we're talking about decryption, so we've now got these two new decryption and encryption uh, functions. So we can, on the fly, in a SQL script, encrypt some data using a certain key, using some methods, using various other bits and pieces. And we can, on the fly, decrypt in the same way. So that's the decryptor, grab our encryptor up. And this is really interesting because I've seen this in lots of GDPR style patterns previously when we're talking about SQL. So we used to do things like saying, well, when I load my data into my, uh, into my database, into my lake, I want to encrypt it with a certain key. And then certain people have that key so they can read it unencrypted. Certain people don't have that key, so they don't see the unencrypted da uh, data, but they can still go query it. They can still have a play around with it. They can still actually do some analysis and statistics and stuff on the encrypted version of that data, uh, which just makes kind of the whole access management GDPR stuff a hell of a lot easier if you have these kind of uh, functions to hand. So I'm excited to see these coming in as to Spark SQL, which means what we can do, there's a, there's a, a GDPR pattern I've seen a few places where you have a essentially a lookup table of the encryption keys so each customer will have their own encryption key stored in a separate table so someone can go in and they can query that customer and they can just see the encrypted version and then the people who have got access to query that particular table including row level access if you kind of wrap it with the is member function um if they can return the decryption value for that customer then they can apply it. so you have a view that passes in the decryption value if you have it and if you don't have it then you can't decrypt it so you can't get access to it so what you can then do is if you get kind of a right to be forgotten, if someone says, hey, look, remove my data, if that customer times out and they need to kind of remove that particular thing, then you can go and just delete that one decryption value and you've permanently removed your ability to decrypt all of that data, no matter how many different tables it's in. So it's a bit like the whole idea of having a centralized password locker. You just delete your password from that locker and then all the different places you've stored that same value, you cannot decrypt it back to the original code is yeah it's an interesting pen don't know how well it will work with some of the kind of the row level uh, stuff that we've got inside databricks but certainly seeing those patterns seeing the ability to encrypt and decrypt on the fly mixed with the ability to have it in a view have table access security about who's able to get to that view all of that kind of stuff rather than keeping a encrypted and a decrypted version of the data in the leg just doing it on the fly super super useful so those two, fairly, fairly big. Lots of things we can do with that. Might do a video in the future about how we do good encryption patterns. Uh, and then some other ones, contains, ends with, starts with, all super useful for doing kind of just search functionality within kind of uh, strings of data. And percentiles, you know, kind of uh, doing a percentile value. So I don't know how that's different to the entile value. I've not really kind of had a look into that. Okay, so it's percentile continuous distribution, which is interesting. Um, so... Interesting stuff on the Spark SQL side if you're looking at that. Uh, the other one, super interesting one, is the low shuffle merge. So this is something that came out in preview a little while ago. So you could enable this uh, back in, as it says, uh, runtime nine, and you could say, I want to shuffle less when I'm doing merges. Now, sometimes this might not matter, uh, but certainly for me, if I'm dealing with uh, an automated leg, and we've got several layers in our leg, so let's talk medallion, we're going bronze, silver, gold. I'd always be landing, just appending data into my bronze layer and then merging data into my silver layer. And that allows me to say, well, it has anything changed. What's our actual gold standard, not gold standard, silver standard current snapshot of the data. Um, and we'd use a merge to do that. And what used to happen with merge is 
any data, well, any files that contain records that have changed. Because of how Parquet works, we need to copy over that whole file into the new state, regardless if 99.9% .9 of the data hadn't changed. We can't leave those in situ. We need to make a new copy of that entire file. So all these rows that hadn't changed in this merge still went through the same process and got shuffled and got spat out, optimized, and whatever it did to sp spit out the data at the end of that process. Even though they hadn't changed, even though maybe we'd ran an optimize and we'd ran a Z order and those, those rows were perfectly beautifully curated and then we do a merge and then it just spits out the, the result and we have to go back and optimize it again and Z order it again and do all that stuff on top of the data. The low shuffle merge is essentially saying rows that haven't changed, put them down that path and it's a lot more optimized. You don't need to do a lot of transformations to it. You don't need to worry about a lot of stuff. You can basically just go right there it would put them back in their original state in a new file representing the original state and then worry about all the changes as a separate path essentially be a bit smarter about what shuffles we apply to data that hasn't changed that's what that is trying to do so if you're doing lots of big long tail shuffles that have kind of small minor updates to big files turn that on well actually it's now turned on by uh default i think no it's not turned on by default yet Ooh. So you can enable your Spark config on either your cluster level or in session level. Enable it to true. Test out your shuffles. See if it goes faster. Not going to be every single type of uh, merge. It, but if you're doing merges that don't actually affect many, many rows, then you should see a huge performance of turning it on. Big, big feature. Now GA. Give it a go. Another one, copy into. So I don't really see many people using copy into uh, in anger, but it's a good one if you've got a load of files and you just want to say, take any files I've not yet read, put them into this tape. So it's doing a little bit similar to what Autoloader is doing. It's kind of a simplified version of Autoloader in a way, but it doesn't do the whole notification queue. Maybe there's not two parallels to make. Um, but certainly you can use the SQL syntax to really easily say, just load into this table anything from this pile of files. And if you've already loaded it, don't bother reloading it. We can now do this validate. So we can now say, I would like to validate, is it going to work? Is the schema changed? Am I going to have to evolve my schema? Or any of my constraints met? So it's like a check, what would happen if I tried to do this? Uh, and you can go and kind of down, do a preview of what the data would look like. Essentially, it's a, should I do this? How much should I hit go on this button? Um, again, haven't really played too much with a copy data function to actually say how useful that is and whether that's kind of, um, how is that going to change things? But certainly doing your... Citizen ETL, people managing and maintaining their own business lookup tables, managing reference data, all of that kind of stuff. Really, really good use case. See that used quite a lot. Uh, being part of your big formal data engineering process, I don't know how much you'd use that because you wouldn't be validating things, you'd be running it in an automated way. Uh, yeah, interesting. Uh, and then otherwise, usual stuff in times of runtime, there's a whole pile of updates, bug fixes, library updates, all that kind of stuff. So if you are going to upgrade all your libraries, Make sure you run it. Make sure you check it if you're relying a lot on external libraries. Oh, okay. So that was a giant pile of stuff. There is a load of updates. Again, kind of tons and tons and tons inside that runtime update. Lots of things to try out. Certainly, I'll be looking at the encryption, decryption on the fly options we can do to try and do some of the same GDPR or kind of, you know, data encryption things we've done in the past. Really, really interesting to see some of kind of uh, the changes on top of that's kind of just how we're actually managing some jobs. I mean, the job cluster stuff should save a lot of money if you're using uh, Databricks jobs. I want to see it. I want to try and use that if we can run it from things like Data Factory, but I don't think we'll be able to yet. And again, be aware of some of those breaking changes. If you're managing and creating cluster clusters on the fly using item potency tokens, have a look and make sure it's not going to break. And if you're doing lots of networking and you've got custom defined user root tables, Go and have a look and make sure you've got those new meta stores added in and you'll all be good. And that is everything I wanted to talk about today. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me down on let me know down in the comments which bits of those that you actually went, ooh, ooh, that's ooh, I want to have a play with that. Any of those bits you're excited with? Any of those bits I've glossed over and said, well, that's a change. And you're like, no, that is way more important than you think. Let me know down in the comments. Always excited to hear what you guys think. But otherwise, I'll see you guys next time. Cheers.